Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on physical therapy. Um, I'm very happy that you all joined this uh, wonderful webinar uh, where we have this wonderful speakers for. Um, so my name is Anne Middelaar and I'm a member of the EEG and um, I will be your host this evening since um, Hussein unfortunately has uh, private matters. So he apologized himself. Um, Kim, will you do the introduction, please, of uh, a welcome's word? Uh... Yes, Anna. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. It's so uh, great to see uh, all of you. It's really nice to really be able to see all of you, of course. I am, um, because not all the webinars we have, we can see each other. So I am Kim Hulsher. I am from the Netherlands, and I'm the co-chair from Engage. And we're very happy with this webinar on physical therapy during and after uh, cancer treatments, which is, of course, very important. But, you know, that is something we will be talking about for the next hour and a half. I remember for myself, I'm a cervical cancer survivor, that the day before my surgery, I was running. Uh, I went for a run. I was like, OK, this is going to be my last run before the surgery. And I was feeling so stupid. I'm like, why would I be running? right now if you know tomorrow i have a surgery and i cannot be doing anything for a long time but now i've learned that it's actually a good thing right to be good prepared for your uh surgery and right after treatment i started working out again and i also believe that um it, it took five years before i developed lymphedema and i believe that is something that's really um uh, that really helps me from you know uh getting lymphedema at such a uh, you know after such a period of time so for a lot of reasons, for lymphedema, for your, um, for your health, for your weight, for your, et cetera, it, it's really good, this physical therapy. So that's why we're really excited uh, that we're going to be talking about this the whole evening. So, Anna, I'll give the word back to you. Thank you. So our first speaker will be Professor Dr. Nela Adriansens, and she graduated as a Master of Science in Rehabilitation Science and Physiotherapy, Revaki, at the Vrije University, Brussels. Uh, Nela works as a part-time associate professor in Revaki at the Faculty Physical Education and Physiotherapy, and she also uh, works with patients. So please, Nela. I give you the word. Thank you. Ah, Thank oh, you so before much. I forget, sorry, there are uh, there is a possibility to have a Q and A at the end of each uh, uh, speech of the professors. Um, you can already write the questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand afterwards. Um, so, excuse me for this interruption again, and I give the word to Neil. Thank you very much, Anne, for the kind introduction. I will start sharing my screen so that we can immediately dive into this uh, interesting evening. I also wanted to uh, take the chance to um, to congratulate, maybe first of all, you with uh, with this webinar and to thank you for the invitation because I think it's a very good initiative. I wasn't aware of your uh, institution or, or of your group, but I really think that you are uh, doing some really nice things and I'm uh, very proud that I can be part of this tonight. Um, let's see, uh, are you seeing my screen now? Yes, that is going well. Okay, thank you very much. So as was explained in the introduction, we would like to tell you something tonight about physical activity as well during as after cancer treatment. And Kim even uh, explained that she also did some exercise before even the treatment. So that's even another uh, part that is important uh, for us tonight. Um, and we will dig right into it. Since you're a European organization, I thought it would be nice to look at what Europe is actually doing for, for you and for us as practitioners and patients. And when they launched the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan a few years ago, there were some three interesting aims that they put forward for their plan. And that's something you can see at left um, bottom of the slide. It's the prevention, it's the cure, and it's the quality of life of the patient. And that's 
quite uh, special because as a physiotherapist with exercise and physical activity, we also aim for those three things. So that's actually something why physiotherapy and physical activity, we will use them um, across each other, I think, tonight and also exercise. That's why it's very important because our aim is the same as the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. So we can add value to this plan with uh, what we are doing or trying to do for the patient. And in the right uh, bottom of the slide, you can see some more details and, and numbers and information on this plan. But what is important there is that you can see that in the list of the quality of life, physical activity or exercise or physiotherapy, it's not mentioned as such. And that was really actually a surprise for me because for us, it's obvious and we already have the knowledge and the science to know that physical activity is so important as well in prevention as in the cure of cancer that I was really surprised not to find this in this plan because they talk about um, tobacco, they talk about alcohol, they talk about about diets in this infographic, but they do not talk about physical activity. So I think there is still maybe a lack in the knowledge and uh, or a misconception about how important this can be. But I also have some good news. A few decades ago, and then I talk about maybe already 50 years ago, um, before that, Patients were advised when they had a treatment, during treatment or after treatment, that they had to take as much rest as possible, take it easy, not to do too much, take their time to recover, to stay in bed. But fortunately, over the years, more and more patients were advised to literally fight their cancer. So they um, really needed to do something themselves. And in my uh, experience with the patients that I see today, they are also requiring to do something themselves. So they want to take control in their own hands about their body and about their uh, mental and physical health. So actually, it's a win-win because they are willing to do something on their own to help with uh, getting better. And so this is also very important, I think, for the patient empowerment and the self-efficacy that patients can take a little bit of the control that they gave out of hand during their treatment back in their own hands and that they can uh, add some value from their own to getting better. And that's also something that I wanted to mention because it's something that is really easy to be um, to be physical active. I mean, it's not easy in a physical way, but it's, uh, you can be physically active without having any special equipment or you can just take a walk outside and you don't need any special um, garments or whatever. So I think as well physically as mentally that this is a very important topic. And um, as I was saying in the maybe the 80s, the first scientific literature was uh, spread or, or uh, published that patients uh, could do some exercise because in the beginning, a lot of oncologists and uh, senologists, hematologists, etc., they thought that it might be too difficult or that it was not safe for patients to do exercise even during the treatment or after the treatment. But so it's only yeah, from the 80s that the first studies were published. And so in the upcoming years, we had to wait until 2003 before the first actual guideline on exercise and cancer survivors was launched. So that's only 20 years ago. And 20 years, it might seem like a lot, but actually when you look in science, 20 years, it's, uh, it was like yesterday, actually. So there has been done some work, but I think there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. This is something that you will all recognize, of course. It's actually the cancer journey. So when you start in the prevention phase, so when you do not have a diagnosis yet, and then you get into 
the period of the diagnosis. This is what we call the pre-diagnostic phase. And this is something important that you have to remember for the rest of the presentation, because we are dividing this cancer journey in different stages or different phases. And what I want to tell you tonight is that physical therapy or physical activity can be important in all of these different stages. Because now there is also a small, yeah, maybe misconception that physiotherapy is for healing and it's for rehabilitation after the cancer and after the treatment. But that's not true. We already know now, for example, that patients in that case, they are not patients yet, but patients to come. So just um, healthy persons, when they are physically active, they have a lot less chance to develop seven types of cancer. And I think that's very important because in general, people are advised to be physically active during their, during their life. Um, for obesity, for diabetes, for cardiovascular disease, but cancer is not always mentioned. And although the science is there, we know this now for seven different types of cancer. So I think that's a really important thing uh, that we can do for the pre-diagnostic phase. Then you come in the phase where you get the diagnosis and before the treatment starts, that's what uh, Kim was telling us in the introduction of this uh, webinar that before the treatment, before her surgery, she was already running. So she was preparing her body to become more uh, fit because the fitter you get, you start with this treatment, the better you come out afterwards. So the rehabilitation for a healthy, strong body will be much easier and when your body is already weak and you do not have a lot of muscles, maybe a little bit too, fat, too much fat. So I think this is really important. But, and that's maybe fortunately, in our countries, in the Western world, the window is very short between the time of diagnosis and the start of the treatment. And that's very good because we have to, to aim to, to start as soon as possible with the treatment. But if we have a window there, actually the best thing to do is to already start preparing the body physically to get it as strong as possible because then they will support, your body will support the treatments much better. So we have pre-diagnosis, pre-treatment, what we also call pre-habilitation. And then we have the treatment phase. And for a long time, the, the oncologist thought that it was not feasible and not safe to have patients to be physically active during the treatment. But fortunately, this has changed over the years. And so now we know that um, we do not want to improve your physical condition at that time. But what we want to do is try to keep the level as, as uh, high as it is or to maintain your physical condition, uh, your stamina. So that's what's also important during the treatment. Then the most well known from all these phases for rehabilitation is, of course, after the treatment. So when all the medical treatment has finished and you get to, to the phase of recovering, you become a survivor, then the uh, cancer rehabilitation programs, that is also what we know the most about. We have the, mo the most literature about this in science. There is the most scientific evidence about this phase that we really know that this is important and this is necessary for a lot of patients. Um, and also it's multidisciplinary because we talk a lot about physiotherapy today, but of course we also need the nutritionists, the psychologists, etc. to work in this phase of the rehabilitation. And then we get to um, yeah, prevention of, for example, secondary uh, cancers or a relapse. That's also an important phase in survivorship. And then, of course, you can... Um, move on with your life and become a survivor but unfortunately for some of, of the patients they come to an advanced cancer and an end, end of life stage but even in this last end of life stage 
it's also important that the physiotherapy and physical exercise or more being physical and autonomous is very, very important. So, and it's also good to know maybe uh, and to keep this in mind that over this whole cancer journey, there is always a place and it's always safe and feasible to have physiotherapy in this, uh, in this journey. So this might seem a little difficult, but I will explain it to you. Why are we actually doing this physical activity? Because of course, the cancer on its own, we will not beat the cancer just by being physically active. But one of the main reasons why we do these exercise programs for the patients, it is because we know that there are many adverse events. And many of you will know it. It was also uh, already explained in the introduction, like for example, lymphedema. We know that these are all consequences and um, negative side effects of the treatment. So that's something that we want to control, try to manage, and may maybe even improve with exercise uh, and with physiotherapy. So what you can see in the schedule on the slide, you see three different colors of lines. And the blue one is related to the cancer therapy. And you can see here now, it's uh, the visual, it's more like uh, chemotherapy, but it also counts for other uh, treatments. For the first line or the first arrow that you see, it's towards fatigue. I don't have to tell you, you will be probably uh, be more aware than myself as you are a patient, that fatigue is one of the main and one of the common side effects of cancer on its own, but also the cancer treatment. And when you become tired and you don't have a lot of energy to do things, you get less physically active. And this means when you get less physically active, that your muscles are going to shrink. The size and the quality of your muscles will slow down. And in the end, you will lose a lot of mus muscle mass, but also muscle quality. So then you become in a negative spiral because you will feel more tired, you get more fatigue, but your muscles will decrease and so you will get even less energy to start another activity. And so it's a downward spiral that is really negative, negatively influencing um, your whole system actually because you, you won't move anymore, you will not be physically active anymore. So there is also a direct effect on the muscles from, for example, if you get certain types of chemotherapy, they also try to kill or to poison the muscles, uh, the muscle fibers. So the quality and the mass will also decrease. And of course, the chemotherapy will also cause the nausea, uh, the insomnia, and in some kind of cancers, you also will have a reduced food intake and also nutrient absorption that will decrease. And then, of course, to build muscles, we need a lot of proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of the muscles. And if we don't get those nutritions, those proteins, we will not be able to, again, restore or rebuild build the muscles. So that's something that is all connected to each other. And that is only due to related to the cancer therapy. On the other hand, the red uh, arrows in the, in the schedule, those are the tumor related effects. And you can see that there are many errors that are pointing at the same direction as for the cancer therapy. So there are three very important adverse events that uh, are important for us as a physiotherapist. That is the, the impact it has on your muscles, not only the muscle mass, but also the muscle quality on the altered fat metabolism. And I think for um, gynecological cancers, you have this uh, outside red arrow that also points towards hormonal alterations. And I think for uh, your group, this is also very important. And it points to the fat metabolism, but also to the muscle loss. And I think this is a really bad combination because due to the alteration of the hormonal balance, there will be a disbalance and the fat will be distributed differently in the body and the muscles will decrease. 
And so you will lose a lot of energy and you will also lose the, the capacity to build back these muscles. So these are three main things that I that for me are very important to work with patients uh, as a physiotherapist. And of course, all of this comes back to a decrease in quality of life, because in the end, you will not be able to do your activities of daily living anymore because you don't have the, the strength, you don't have the energy to do it. And you're, um, you will be in a complete disbalance in your body, like, for example, or also the body composition that will be altered. And part of the body composition is, for example, also the extracellular fluid, and that's related to lymphedema. But that will be uh, one of the things that will be discussed in the next presentation. So all these mechanisms and alterations in the body, finally, they are leading to many different uh, yeah, impairments in the body. And you, maybe you will recognize some of the impairments that you can see here, like the cognitive impairment, but also very important for us is exercise intolerance and this muscle atrophy. And when you combine those two, the patient will be completely sedentary and in this downward negative spiral. And that's for us something, a key point that we have to tackle when we start with physiotherapy, together, of course, with all the other side effects that might happen. Also, for example, for gynecological cancer, the bone demin demineralization is, is also a very important one because it's also directly related to um, for example, the hormonal changes. And this will cause the osteopenia, the osteoporosis, etc. This is also, um, I think, very relevant for gynecological cancer. I chose this image, by the way, of, with the astronauts, because it's uh, actually a quite nice, or I think it's quite nice, the, the similarities that they found between an astronaut that is taking a space trip uh, in a space shuttle and a patient that receives a cancer treatment. Because I don't know if you're aware of this, but when an astronaut has to go into space, he's really like an, uh, an, an athlete. They, he has to prepare himself to become a, a really a sportsman. He, they are almost professional athletes at that point when they, when they go into space. But when they return due to, for example, the inactivity, the weight change, uh, the microgravity, etc they lose so much muscle and so much of their physical capacity that they cannot even walk out of the space shuttle when they re-enter um, to, to the earth so that's really a combination and that's also why we want to make our patient athletes before they start with the treatment and that's why i, I found this a really nice um comparison between the astronaut and the patient. The title of this slide is Cancer Does Not Like Exercise. This is a really, uh, for me, this is the summary actually that everybody needs to know on the impact of uh, exercise in all these different stages. So you have the detection phase, then you have the uh, treatment phase, the survivorship, and then the end of life uh, phase. And so what you can see here is that in all these different stages, and that was what I was explaining you in the introduction, with exercise in all these different parts, we can have a major clinical impact. We know that we can prevent seven types of cancer just by being physically active and to exercise. We know during the treatment that there is an enhanced drug tolerance. So patients who are physically active and doing exercise during the chemotherapy, we know that their tolerance for the drug is much better. So there will be less delays of cancer cycles. Uh, there will be less uh, um, diminution of the doses of the chemotherapy. So those are very important things also related to uh, relapse, for example, but also uh, more psychologically, fear of recurrence. If you have to skip uh, a cycle of your chemotherapy because uh, your body is not, not doing well or not tolerating it, then of course it gets into your head and you will have more fear of recurrence. So physically, as well as psychosocially, 
it's very important to know that it can also improve your tolerance. It will also improve the efficacy, so also direct impact on survival rates, and also an amelioration of the adverse events. So people, uh, patients who are doing uh, exercise, physical activity during their treatment, we know from from a lot of literature and a lot of scientific work that it it makes your adverse effects better. And that's really important. So our um, job is actually to point out that you have to start as soon as possible. Of course, in the prevention phase, we as a physiotherapist, we do not see these patients. But from the moment of diagnosis, we are really aiming to see the patients and to start with the patient as soon as possible because of all these positive effects. And of course, in the long run, during the survivorship and the rehabilitation phase, it's more, I think, uh, common sense that you have a prevention of the relapse. That's what I was talking about uh, before as well. And an amelioration of the long-term adverse effects. So that's something that you cannot underestimate. And that's also something that we talk to a lot of uh, oncologists and other health workers that everybody needs to motivate the patients to stay physically active or to become physically active. Um, and even in the last phase in the palliation, there is also a role for exercise and it has an important clinical impact. It has the same impact as in the other phases. The only thing that comes, comes along with this is the attenuation of cancer cachexia. So cachexia, when your muscles are melting down and you are losing your mass, but also, for example, when your um, your uh, fat mass or your fat metabolism is changing and you also lose a lot of weight due to fat uh, that is disappearing from your body, then you will also have an attenuation of cancer cachexia. And cachexia, it's also an important risk factor for mortality in this phase. So if we can tackle the cachexia, we will also tackle the mortality. So this is a very, for me, very important slide, and it's all, all based on evidence. And so it's actually strange when I presented the first slides why it's not in the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan that people should be physically active because you see all these positive effects and it's feasible and it's safe for everybody. That's maybe a little frustration there, but I will uh, try to keep it for that. Um, we also have a group of uh, European physiotherapists who are involved in uh, this type of research, but also in clinical practice. And we are changing, interchanging some best practices. And we always use the same um, yeah, schedule, like from prevention, prehabilitation, the treatment, rehabilitation after cancer and advanced cancer. And so we did a small literature review and we put all our uh, expert opinions together and we came out with 10 different uh, statements along this journey for the patient. What the role of the physiotherapist could be for patients during and after and before their cancer treatment. So there were like 13 European authors and uh, I think 11 or 12 different countries that participated to this. So I think it's actually uh, a quite big uh, position paper. Uh, we also pointed out that it's multidisciplinary. That's also something that I already told you uh, tonight, that it's important that it's not only physiotherapy that is important. And afterwards, we also did a survey uh, on access, for example, for rehabilitation services, education of physiotherapists in all these different countries. And so we are working on this as European uh, physiotherapists to improve also the quality of education uh, for physiotherapists who wants to become uh, specialized in this topic. These are the 10 different statements. Um, I think what is uh, the most important, but most of them are already tackled during the previous slides. What is very important, I think, is that uh, physiotherapy does not only include exercise. I think we need much more than exercise because you can build a really nice training program, but you also need the motivation, so motivational interview, 
uh, interviewing can be important, also coaching, but also behavior change, uh, information, giving information to the patient why they have to do this. These are also very important things in physiotherapy that come along with the exercise program. So that's uh, something that I thought is uh, really important. But uh, we will share the presentation so you have the statements um, and you can, uh, you can read them afterwards. What is also important, now we get into the more practical uh, point of view, for exercise, there are guidelines and they are international, they are multidisciplinary as well. And we know from different types of exercise, so the two big groups of exercise are aerobic exercise. This means that you are working on your physical uh, capabilities. Uh, that you are doing like running or uh, on a bicycle, for example, and you work on your stamina. And on the other side, you have resistance training. And that's really to strengthen, to build up your muscles, your muscle, muscle mass and muscle quality. And the best thing is in a, a program for cancer rehabilitation, when you combine these both um, different types of exercise. So we need aerobic exercise and we need strength and training and so you can see all the positive effects on anxiety depression fatigue quality of life uh, also physical functioning of course and they pointed out in this inter international uh, recommendation or guideline that you have to do the aerobic exercise three times a week for 30 minutes and the resistance training twice a week for 30 minutes per session. We will get more into detail. Uh, Here you can see uh, more the details and um, over the years, because the last uh, consensus document, it was from 2019. So we are already five years later and you see that now they are changing it a little twice or three times a week. Uh, also, the repetition can be different. So sometimes you have between eight and 12 repetitions. Sometimes they say between 12 and 15 repetitions to do the strengthening exercise. So that's something um, that is changing a little, but the exact amount of exercise that every different type of cancer needs, that is not, uh, not known, well known yet. So that's something that we still need to do some more research about. So this is about the aerobic exercise. So this is really when your heart rate is increasing and when you feel that you get into a breathlessness uh, state, uh, you do not have to run a marathon. Um, you do not, uh, when you just go for a walk every day for like uh, 10, 20 minutes as start as a starting point, that's more than enough. They say sometimes small portion, a small portion a day keeps the doctor away. So I think I totally agree with this. Um, and even during the treatment, it can be much less, uh, but you really need to start activating your body or keep your body active also because of the behavioral change. You really need to get into this uh, yeah, physical activity and use your energy and storage of your energy better. So you, here you can find some, uh, yeah, it's like resources for patients uh, that were developed uh, from the recommendation document. And so here you can see they give some advices on what you can do, how often, how, how hard you have to do it. They did the same thing for the muscle health, so the strengthening training. What is important here is that you need your muscle strength, especially for your balance, uh, for the fatigue and the quality of life. Also for doing your activities in daily living, it's very important that you do this. And it does not have to be that you become a bodybuilder, uh, but it's very important to stay, uh, yeah, to, st to start or stay staying using your muscles. Uh, so that's also very important. Also, it says also during chemotherapy, it's very important because the, the muscles are metabolizing the chemotherapy and the toxicities of the chemotherapy. So you, we really need those muscles. And that's, of course, why we are physi physiotherapists, because we like those muscles uh, so much.
What is very important to uh, mention as well is that you need always a rest day in between two sessions of strengthening training. That's to restore and rebuild the muscle fibers. If you do it every day, then uh, your muscles, they will need much more proteins. And so there will become, you will become in a disbalance and that's not good as well. So one day or 24 hours at least of rest between the exercises. And then other types of physical activity are also recommended, as you can see here, stretching uh, and also daily um, yeah, general things like uh, making the 10,000 steps a day, for example, or the 150 minutes uh, of uh, moderate activity for one week. Also try to make it fun. Uh, Choose something that you really like. If you like dancing, if you like a walk with your dog, don't force it. Just go for what you like. And that's already more than something. And also for balance. So um, just most of the time it's related to the peripheral neuropathy that you can have a difficulty with your balance. But this is something that uh, is also really important in physical activity. Of course, it also depends on uh, what is the complexity of the adverse events that you are experiencing? So uh, most of the patients, they start in a high complexity where we give them a lot of guidance. They are really, uh, there is a good environment. They are really um, yeah, held by their hands, let's say, and it's a really safe environment. And then the, the better they get or the, the least uh, complex it gets, uh, the more free they are to do this exercise. And we really are aiming for every patient in the end that they try to get independent so that they just go to regular uh, physical activities or sports activities outside of the hospital, outside of the healthcare, uh, and that everybody just becomes an active person. That's really also something that we should aim for. But so depending on the complexity of the side effects and the adverse events, you need different in um, yeah people to to guide you and different to uh, to support you and also the environment of course is a lot different. Here I also put some fact sheets because I thought it might be uh, important. Uh, we also, with this group of European physiotherapists, we develop a lot of resources. And so you can find them through the QR codes or on the website. And I think it's good for as well the physiotherapists as the patient. And we choose always a topic. This is, uh, for example, on lymphedema and the other one is on fatigue uh, because they are two common side effects, unfortunately. And so I think it might also be helpful for you and the organization uh, to also spread these fact sheets because it's uh, yeah, an infographic that is understandable for everybody and also to create more awareness about these adverse events. Also, the sources uh, are always science based. Because when you when a lot of patients dive into the internet, they found they find a lot of um, yeah doctor Google recommendations etc. But that's also something with our group that we are trying to avoid and that we give uh, scientific based uh, information. And then my last slide. Um, maybe you know him, Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's a famous uh, film actor in Belgium, and we call him the Muscles from Brussels. So we also called our um, program for uh, the patients in Brussels, the Muscles from Brussels. And I have a, sh a small uh, video on how we are doing it. Um, maybe today we will not have the time to, to look at it together, but I put the link there. And so if you're interested to see how we are doing it in Brussels, because we are we have different um, rehabilitation programs in group uh, for patients with different types of cancer, but also individual guidance. Um, and so that's just something that I wanted to share with you and also maybe for our network to see and to learn from each other um, that we know from each other what we're doing. And then I came to the last slide. I hope I didn't take too much of the time uh, because I don't have a watch here, but um, I will be happy to give the floor back to Alma uh, to get to the second presentation. Thank you much for thank you very much for your uh, for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Neil, for this interesting um, 
uh, webinar. So, um, indeed, we are a little bit over time, but we still have uh, 10 minutes for uh, questions. Are there any questions uh, of anybody? As Nele mentioned, there will the presentation will be available. So um, I, I assume, um, and then I'm looking at Susanna, that it will be on the members page of Engage, where you can uh, rewatch uh, also the recording of this uh, webinar and also see the slides. No question. Ito uh, says would... great lecture. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It was really a great lec uh, lecture and uh, I actually have a both experience. So I had uh, been diagnosed last year and then I was really like coming off from preparation for marathon. So I was really active during uh, the whole, um, let's say, treatment and uh, also after surgery. And they told me also that it helped a lot, the, the recovery. Unfortunately, I have a relapse this year. So uh, actually today I have my third chemotherapy, so I'm a little bit um, out. But uh, this time around, I really experienced, um, despite of being really very active person, I really have difficulties to, to move. So I really have to force myself. Main issue is that I have a lot of pains. So uh, it's difficult to stand or, or just walk. So uh, how... <laughs> how to go around when you have pains and yeah in mind you are an active person but it's just difficult so uh, how how do you support this uh, in this situation yes that's really a good comment and thank you for sharing this with us and uh, i'm sorry to hear this about uh, your treatment um, but i think it's important something very important that you mentioned is the pain of course and as a physiotherapist we are also trained in pain management we start with the pain education so that you know where it comes from and it's also actually a signal from your body which is actually really good because it gives you a sign here it has to stop and I don't want to say that recovery or rest is, is never possible or never necessary, but I think you need to find the balance, but of course first treat the, the pain symptoms and that's also something that we can do with comfort treatment as a physiotherapist, like massages or maybe warm treatment etc and of course during your chemotherapy it's not possible but maybe after the chemo swimming uh, sometimes also relieves uh, the pain symptoms so that's something that might also help uh, if you go to a public pool if you have another option like a private pool it might be possible if you do not have other um, contraindications but this pain Actually, it's a good symptom of your body because it tells you, okay, you need to stop and there is something going on here. Uh, you have to do something with this. But on the other hand, we also need to try to treat this pain so that you can start doing your activities in daily living. And as I mentioned, during the treatment, of course, you don't have to go running or be a sports athlete or whatever, but just try to keep your body in motion and then uh, afterwards, it will help you in recovering faster. Uh, but you also need to listen to your body from time to time. And if it says stop, then you have to stop. I don't know how much time you have between your chemo cycles, but it can be that there are a few days that, that you're not doing well, and that's perfectly normal. But after a few days and before the next sessions, there might be a few days that you are in a better condition and that you can start doing something, but you don't have to push over the limit because then it will have negative consequences as mm. well, of course. I think it's also okay. a lot about mental that you really yeah. need to convince yourself to exercise. Yes, that's yeah. true. But since you were a marathon runner, I don't think you will. Uh, Ali, I'm sure you know the, the advantages and you have a very strong uh, mind. And so I think you will get through it, of course. And if you need some rest now, just take your rest. And in a few days, you will feel better again. And then you can start moving again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We just have luck. one. We we have one more question. Sorry, Biata, but uh, we have other questions as well. Just yes. uh, two minutes to <laughs> to answer this. It's a question from uh, Sonia, and Sonia yeah. asks which types of exercise are possible in an advanced and palliative phase. 
Yeah, that's also in the same line as with the pain complaints. If it's not possible, of course, it's not possible. But for the palliative and the advanced cancer, what is really important for us as a physiotherapist is the uh, bone metastasis. So if there are any metastases on, for example, the vertebrae or in the lung uh, bones, then you really need to pay attention. But even just walking, not with weightlifting, etc., just using your own weight, doing squats, doing wall push-ups, just using your own body as a weight, that's that's more than enough. Just, uh, yeah, you don't have to, to force it. It can always be possible. And of course, comfort therapy, like the pain complaints, the massages, the warmth, the sometimes electrostimulation to relax the muscles. That's also some things, uh, the tense treatment that we can do as a physiotherapist for to help the patients. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Neela. Thank you. Um, yes. We had a really people saying that it's a great lecture. So thank you very much. Thank for you that. Very much. So um, now I am. Um, we're going to the next speaker, and it's Professor Don, Doctor Anne Tassanoy, and Anne works as an associate professor in Rivaki, also at. Uh, the Vrije Universiteit of Brussels. She teaches many courses, mainly about lymphology and vascular pathology, oncologic rehabilitation and urologic gynecologic rehabilitation. And beside this academic career, she has her own private physiotherapy practice. So uh, this evening she will speak about lymphatic problems and pelvic floor dysfunction. Without further ado, I give the word to Anne. Thank you very much, Anne, for speaking for us as well. Thank you. Um, okay. I will share my presentation. So can you see my slides? Can you okay. put it on <laughs> see presentation mode? Is Thank you. It's better like this? Yes, okay. much. Yeah, okay. So good evening, everybody. Also, thank you for the invitation uh, to this webinar. And in my part of this webinar, I want, in fact, to talk about cancer treatment complication, uh, in particular of gynecological cancer treatments, in fact, that hinder physical activity. Um, gynecological cancers refer to malignancies that originate in a woman's uh, reproductive organs, uh, including uh, the ovaries, uh, the cervix, the uterus, uh, the vagina, and uh, the vulva. Incidence of gynecological cancer varies widely depending on uh, the specific type. These are some numbers from Belgium. Um, in 2022, uh, around 1,500 um, um, new diagnoses were made of uh, endometrial cancer, followed by around 750 ovarian cancers and um, 650 uh, cervical cancers. And this compared to uh, new breast cancers diagnosis, where we had in the same year in Belgium, uh, 11, 000, around 11,300 new diagnosis of uh, breast cancer. So the treatment of gynecological cancer had advanced significantly uh, in recent years, uh, offering uh, improved outcomes and survival rates for patients. Treatment approaches are often tailored uh, to the type and stage of the cancer and can include surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, targeted therapy, or a combination of these different modalities. 
So surgery is um, frequently the first line treatment aimed at removing uh, the tumors and affective, um, affected surrounding tissues with or without a, a lymph node dissection. More advanced cancer stage, um, may require a multidisciplinary approach with uh, systemic uh, treatments like chemotherapy or immunotherapy or with uh, localized therapies such as radiotherapy of the pelvis or of uh, the lymph nodes. The long-term side effects of uh, gynecological cancer treatment can significantly impact uh, a woman's quality of life and often result in lasting physical, uh, emotional, psychological side effects. Common uh, long-term side effects include lymphedema, of the lower limbs and the genital area. And also a lot of women may experience uh, bowel or bladder dysfunctions, sexual dysfunctions, and even an uh, onset of early menopause and all the complaints uh, coming with this menopause. So first, let's have a look at lymphedema of the lower limbs and the genital area after the treatment of uh, gynecological cancer. So what is the lymphatic system? Uh, the lymphatic system consists of a network of lymphatic vessels all over the body, lymph nodes and some organs like uh, the spleen, uh, the thymus and the tonsils. Lymphatic, trans, uh, lymphatic vessels transport a clear fluid called lymph, in fact, which contains also white blood cells and proteins throughout uh, the body and it has an important function in fighting uh, of infections. The lymph nodes are very small bean-shaped structures that play a critical role in the uh, immune system. They are distributed throughout the lymphatic system and act as uh, filtration hubs where lymph passes through. They are mostly, uh, they are most commonly uh, clustered in areas um, around the neck, around the armpit, in the abdomen, and uh, in the groin. So what is now the function of this lymphatic system? As I mentioned before, it plays a very important role in the immune system uh, because it has uh, immune cells in uh, the lymph, uh, lymph nodes. So it defends against infections and facil facilitates removal of weeds, waste and toxins, uh, toxins. It's at the abdomen, in fact, it also absorbs um, dietary fat. And for us, also important, it plays an uh, important role in uh, maintaining the fluid balance of our um, body. So when the lymphatic system is compromised or blocked, it can lead to conditions such as lymphedema, where a lymph fluid builds, builds up in tissues and causes a secondary swelling. What about that lymph node metastasis? Um, lymph node metastasis refers to the spread of the cancer cells from the primary tumor site to the nearby uh, lymph nodes. This process is a key indicator that cancer may be advancing as it suggests that malignant cells have begun to travel uh, throughout the body through uh, this 
this lymphatic system. Uh, when cancer spreads to the lymph nodes, it can indicate a more aggressive form of uh, the disease uh, and potentially increasing the risk of further metastasis in other um, organs, in distant organs. So the presence of lymph node metastasis is also a critical factor in determining the stage of cancer, guiding treatment decisions and influencing also uh, prognosis. So treatment strategies for the lymph node metastasis uh, may include also again surgery by removing or resection of uh, those lymph nodes or um, locally radiation therapy or systematic uh, therapy like chemotherapy or other targeted therapies. So let's have a look to the lymphatic drainage of our genital tract. Um, the female reproductive organs drain towards the lymph nodes in the grown, uh, that's in case of the vulva and the lower part of the vagina. Um, the cervix and the upper part of the vagina will drain in the pelvic lymph nodes and um, the uterus and the ovaries will drain in uh, abdominal lymph nodes. So that makes uh, these lymph nodes, in fact, uh, a target for metastas metastatic spread and, of course, also for uh, further treatment. So what about secondary lymphedema? Uh, it's a chronic condition characterized by swelling of uh, specific parts of the body here in case uh, it will be the lower limbs or the genital area. And it's caused by damage or obstruction to the lymphatic system. In case of cancer treatment, it can be uh, due to the removal of those uh, metastatic uh, lymph nodes. So when uh, the lymphatic system is compromised, uh, it cannot effectively drain uh, fluids. It will accumulate in the tissues, which causes swelling and gives a chronic inflammation. And at the end, it will result in tissue fibrosis and an abnormal deposition of uh, adipose tissue also. In Western countries, and malignancy and cancer treatment are uh, the most common causes of secondary lymphedema. And incidence and prevalence depends on the cancer stage, um, the surgical procedures and some additional treatments that are used to fight the cancer, and also with some patient-related factors like uh, a higher BMI, uh, obesitas is a known um, risk factor for the development of secondary lymphedema, but also the presence of other comorbidities or uh, presence of uh, infections. So when we look at gynecological cancer, um, the present reported incidence of lower lymph edema is in literature between zero and 70%. Lymphedema advances in different uh, stages. So first, after a lymphatic uh, injury, fluid will accumulate in the surrounding tissues. This causes an inflammation reaction in this tissue uh, with deposition of some inflammatory cells and um, adipocytes. At the end, uh, there will be overgrowth of adipocytes and also uh, fibrosis. And you see at the end, it also further compromises the lymphatic functioning. These stages of edema has also their uh, different complaints and symptoms. The first stage, in fact, is stage zero or a latent uh, stage. 
um, at this early stage, there may be no visible swelling, uh, but the patient has complaints of having heavy uh, legs. The legs are, um, have the feeling of being fatigued, in fact. But uh, there is no visible swelling, but the lymphatic system is already impaired. Uh, the skin feels normal uh, and we can not measure any swelling. In the second stage, um, swelling begins to appear, but is still uh, mild. Um, and typically, typically it resolves with elevation of the lymphatus of after an overnight sleep uh, with the legs elevated, um, edema will be um, resolved. Tissue is still soft uh, and there is still no uh, permanent damage at this point. In its stage two, uh, also called the spontaneously irreversible stage, swelling becomes more pronounced uh, and it doesn't go away with elevation or after an overnight sleep. Tissues may start to feel a little bit firmer due to the fibrosis and um, the deposition of those adipose tissues and the skin will come harden ha a little bit harder. Uh, fluid builds up and it becomes more chronic. And then in stage three, also called the stage of elephantiasis, this is the most advanced stage. Uh, um, the skin becomes also thickened and leathery. Uh, patients are more susceptible to uh, infections like cellulitis. Um, and uh, this condition can lead also to mobility um, issues. So understanding uh, these different stages of lymphedema is crucial in the early diagnosis and also in the intervention. So because timely treatments eh, can progress, uh, can prevent the progression of uh, the condition, and very important, can improve patients' quality of life. So let's have a look at the prevalence of uh, lymph edema after the treatment of gynecological cancer. So after cervical cancer, incidence of lower lymph edema is around uh, 8 to 42%. 42%. Um, when we see the main age of diagnosis of patients with cervical cancer is around uh, 45 to 50 years, and half of the patients is diagnosed in uh, a stage one uh, cancer diagnosis. Luckily, the five-year survival rate is around 80 to 98%. This means that we um, work with a very, in fact, a relatively young uh, patient group with luckily a uh, long survival, but it's very, very important there to be aware of this complication of lymphedema and recognize early signs and symptoms. In case of ovarian cancer, uh, in literature, we find an incidence between 4 and 30%. And with endometrial cancer, between 1 and 47%. Risk factors are the extensiveness of lymph node dissection, um, radiotherapy, uh, having uh, an infection, and obesity. Uh, for the vulvar cancer, incidence of lower lymph edema is higher, between 10 to uh, 73%. Uh, this is because of the involvement of those lymph nodes um, in the grown. They are also important in the drainage of uh, the lower limbs. Uh, that's why uh, the incidence there uh, is higher. Risk factors are, again, the same. Uh, um, the extensiveness of lymph node dissection, infection, and uh, radiotherapy. 
So what are complications of lymphedema? So over time, uh, mobility and functioning of the affected lymph uh, may be reduced, leading to physical disability. Eh? Together with the cosmetic appearance, also this can result in psychological stress or social isolation. Long-time treatment also has an important uh, financial consequences, uh, certainly in Belgium, as um, compression bandages, for instance, are not uh, refunded um, by our uh, receive. In case of a genital lymphedema, uh, it can cause problems while urinating, problems with sexual intercourse. Uh, edema can, uh, uh, lymphatic flu fluid can ooze. It can itch. Um, swollen labia cause some discomfort and give uh, yeah, this cosmetic appearance. Skin uh, changes can occur, like papillomatosis, uh, what you see in the picture here. And for instance, also cellulitis or dermohypodermitis. It's a bacterial inflammation from the lower limbs or the genitalia, uh, which causes also sudden fever, redness, warmth, uh, pain, and uh, volume increase. The diagnosis of lymphedema can be made based on anamnesis and uh, the patient's complaints, and they can give an indication also of the stage of lymphedema. So the early signs are the feeling of swelling, heaviness, tension, fatigue, and these are signs for stage zero, uh, for the latent um, stage. Impression of clothing, uh, as visible swelling, uh, that is reversible after elevation. Pitting is present, uh, you can press some pits uh, in the edema, are signs for um, stage one lymphedema. When pitting uh, becomes absent, uh, when edema is irreversible, uh, when fibrosis and adipose tissues are formed, these are signs for a stage two or a stage three lymphedema. Furthermore, other examinations can be done to have an idea about volume increase or uh, tissue changes. Uh, those examinations were also mentioned in the last sheet of NELA uh, of lymphedema. While there is in fact no cure for lymphedema, prevention is very, very, very important and early consistent management can help to control the progression of uh, lymphedema. So it is very important that we as a physiotherapist have to inform our patients about avoiding risk of developing secondary lymphedema. So they have to avoid uh, extreme Extreme temperatures like ice packing, uh, heating packs, uh, going to the sauna, uh, avoid sunburns and also avoid pinching um, of the limp by clothes, socks, shoes, jewelry. Proper skin care is also very, very important. Hydration of the skin, avoiding... Oh, my presentation is gone. We would like to ask the participant, Alice Finn, if she could stop sharing screen because this automatically stops the screen sharing of our speaker. Oh. I lost my presentation. There we go. Can you please reshare your presentation again? Um, okay. Is it okay like that? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Um, 
Control weight is also very important and um, it's also important to be physical active without overload and uh, prolonged standing and long time, uh, long distance travel has to be avoided. So the treatment, the most common and effective treatment is called complete decongestive uh, therapy, which starts with MLD, eh, manual lymphatic drainage. It's a specialized gentle massage technique to promote lymph flow away from the congested areas by increasing activity of normal lymphatic vessels and bypassing the damaged lymph vessels. Advantage is that we not only drain uh, fluid, but also the proteins, and it's very important in this subjective um, in case of subjective complaints and stage one and two lymphedema. In some cases, in some cases uh, sequential pneumatic compression therapy can be added to the, the MLD. It's an electric air compression pump uh, connected to electric uh, inflatable sleeves uh, that blow up. The major disadvantage is that it only reabsorbs fluids and not the proteins. And there is a accumulation of fluid at the base there where uh, there is no compression. And in case of our patients, uh, uh, lymph nodes of the crone are resected. Uh, the lymph um, flow is blocked there. And there with those leaves, you... Uh, uh, but all you have an accumulation of extra fluid over there. Uh, to maintain the result of MLD and possibly uh, presotherapy, uh, multilayer non-elastic compressors compressing bandages will be applied in the decongestion phase. Uh, they will reduce filtration from fluid into the tissues and increase the venous and lymphatic drainage by improving uh, the function of the venous pump. Uh, it also will uh, increase the reabsorption, reabsorption surface area um, of the edema and will soften uh, subcutaneous tissues and avoid fibrosis. After a maximal volume redu reduction, uh, compression garments will be measured, for instance, um, uh, pants or uh, stockings in which in favor of a, a great degree um, compression. So this is an overview of uh, prevention and early diagnosis of lymphedema, the staging procedures and anamnesis, and the possible treatments uh, depending on the different stages. So now we will have a look at uh, bladder, bowel, and other pelvic floor dysfunctions uh, after uh, cancer treatment. So the most... Uh, I'm just uh, to tell you in the timing, uh, it's uh -huh. five minutes. So, oh. yeah. Okay, <laughs> I will hurry up. Um, so I will skip in the uh, numbers of the prevalence. Um, important is uh, urinating urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, and the presence of um, pain and sexual dysfunction. Important is that the burden remains significant over time and even will increase in the long term. It causes a lot of personal dis distress. And again, also this restricts physical activity partition participation. Uh, very important also is that these complaints are often underreported to healthcare uh, professionals because of uh, the issue of shame about uh, these complaints. Um, 
So when we look at problems with the bowel, uh, enteritis and proctitis can uh, occur with as symptoms, diarrhea, pain, rectal bleeding, urgency, fecal leakage and malabsorption. Uh, fistulas uh, can occur with as a result fecal incontinence or a malodorous discharge. Strictures can cause pain, constipation and thin caliber stools and hemorrhoids can cause uh, bleeding. Risk factors are uh, a high radiation dose of the pelvis and other comorbidities that are, were already present. Problems to the genital urinary tract can uh, result in dysuria, frequent voiding, urgency, stress incontinence, that's the loss of urine with increasing intra-abdominal pressure. Also, again, fistulae uh, strictures uh, can occur and um, cystitis, um, that's an infection of the bladder, uh, can give symptoms of bleeding. Risk factors, again, uh, uh, radiotherapy and uh, smoking also is a risk factor of uh, those symptoms. Gynecological uh, problems uh, that can be caused are uh, the early onset of uh, menopause with the complaints of hot flushes, vaginal dryness, and also vaginal stenosis, which can uh, give symptoms of bleeding, pain, pain with intercourse, vaginal shortness of dyspareunia. Again, uh, uh, bit the same risk factors, uh, the radiation dose, the higher age, uh, lack of compliance uh, with dilatator use and um, having a chemotherapy. When we look at urinary symptoms, screening um, is important and we will assess symptoms and a physician can also uh, do some urodynamic examination. Uh, medical management for urinary, in urinary incontinence depending on pathology and also very important depending on some contraindication can be, for instance, local estrogen therapy or a medical treatment for an hyperactive bladder or urge incontinence. Cystitis uh, can also be treated, can be prevented uh, with uh, mesna or hyperhydratation of the bladder uh, or has to be treated with medication. Um, where a physiotherapist plays an important role is in patient education and self-management for urinary incontinence. Um, lifestyle management is very important and uh, a physiotherapist can help with bladder retraining and pelvic floor exercises. In case of bowel symptoms, um, Again, for the screening, we have to assess symptoms and when it's necessary, for instance, an endoscopic assessment can be pre uh, prescribed by a physician. Medical management for fecal incontinence can be, for instance, the use of uh, stool bulking agents to prevent constipation of uh, or diarrhea. Uh, some topical agents for passive incontinence or referral to biofeedback or uh, defunctioning surgery. Again, the role of the physiotherapist for fecal incontinence can be a toileting exercise and giving some information about the use of over-the-counter bulking agents. Very important is to prevent uh, constipation and this, this can be done with uh, some uh, dietary and lifestyle advice. For instance, drinking a lot of water around one and a half to two liters a day. We eating uh, fibers, oats, linseed, fruits, and very important, avoid alcohol. And again, very, very important, be physical active. 
Uh, we can also give some advice about laxative and about the correct positioning for evacuation. So here you see an uh, image uh, how um, the correct position um, is on the toilet. Uh, the knees elevated with the foot re feet resting on a bench. And then, uh, yeah, you can see the picture. Bulge your abdomen and then uh, give a little bit of pressure. And then the last, uh, sexual and intimacy problems. Also, therefore, exists some checklist and is it is very important to the referral of the proper specialist, like a gynecologist, psychologist, or a sexual health specialist. Important is also the screening for additional menopause health-related risks, like osteoporosis or vascular disease. Different symptoms have also the medical management, uh, like um, medication, um, use of physical general physical therapy or pelvic health uh, pelvic floor therapy um, we can also refer to a sexual health specialist but the physiotherapist has also again an important function in a patient education for instance, for vaginal symptoms, uh, the use of non-hormonal treatments like moisturizers, vaginal moisturizers or gels, um, giving some information about the use of a dilatator or um, do some Kegel exercises, treating other symptoms like pain, nausea, um, that is why the, where the physiotherapist can play an important role. So this is a little bit what we can do as a physiotherapist, not only to improve uh, um, pelvic floor, uh, but also uh, very important when those physical complaints can be improved, also quality of life will be improved of the patients and which um, is very important in physical and uh, the emotional impact of um, pelvic, fro pelvic floor problems and that occur after cancer treatments. So it was, the end of my presentation. I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne. Are there any questions for Anne? We still have uh, like nine minutes if you want to stay on time. Nobody? So um, I have a question actually. Um, if I, as a patient, um, find some of those symptoms like pelvic pain or 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 uh, I don't know what to do. How can I get in contact with a physiotherapist? Uh, it's um yeah I know in Belgium there is a association uh, called BCAP uh, where there is a referral of physiotherapists that are specialized in treatment of uh, pelvic floor problems. Uh, I don't know for other countries, uh, but it's very very important to, to have a physiotherapist that is specialized in pelvic floor problems. Um, I think it's very important to ask your, uh, for instance, gynecologist that she or he knows a uh, referral for such a physiotherapist that are specialized because not everybody, every uh, physiotherapist uh, treats um, um, pelvic floor, floor problems. Because um, what... What I find is that often couples, they end up with a sexual logic, um, um, but not really with, with a physiotherapist. Yeah, it depends on the complaints. Eh? Uh, sometimes uh, um, sexuologists uh, will uh, or can try to resolve the problems, but it all depends on 
the problems. And sometimes it will be a physiotherapist or the combination of uh, both uh, in fact, uh, it is, it's not only a physical problem or uh, it's combination of different uh, problems that need also a different approach. Uh, the, pro the, the approach from a sexologist is other uh, on another way than our approach, in fact. Okay, thank you. Anybody else a question? No? no. So thank you, Anne Tassenoy, and thank you, Nile Adriansen, for this wonderful webinar. I hope you all uh, have learned something. Um, um, well, um, the uh, record of this webinar, as I told, will be in the member part of uh, the website. And, um, well, I wish you all a very good night then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.